Hey guys, welcome to the Macros Bodybuilding and Powerlifting Podcast. Today with me, Pascal Floor. Today we have somehow a special kind of episode for you guys in which we collected all the valuable information from our past guests such as Brad Schoenfeld, James Krieger, Mike Isretel of course and Eric Helms in which they are talking about everything around hypertrophy and in regards to the volume, the frequency, protein intake, how fast you should gain muscle or not and uh, yeah without further ado let's dive straight into the first scene which is Brad Schoenfeld talking about volume. So what I'll say is is that the recent meta analysis we did showed a clear dose response relationship meaning that as volume went up so did the uh, the corresponding hypertrophy. So five sets or, or four sets or less uh, per muscle per week, and we, we looked at it in terms of training a muscle group, per, uh, how many times per muscle per week, uh, four times per week or less uh, resulted in about 5% growth, went up to around 7% growth between five to nine sets uh, per muscle per week, and then 10 plus uh, sets per week was about 10% muscle growth. And we could not find, the literature was not robust enough to get any detail beyond those, beyond 10 sets per week. Uh, so we don't know at what point you might hit a threshold on an average basis. So in putting that into practical terms, you get almost double the amount of growth by doing 10 sets per muscle per week as you do for less than five sets per week. Uh, so that said, does that mean that if you keep doing 10 sets, let's say we would just throw 10 sets out, is that optimal? It would maybe 15 be optimal? Or would maybe, um, undulating the volume over time and that's now a concept that I, I look to study in the future where what we do know is that training with consistently high volumes over time tends to result in overtraining and that's going to have a negative effect but we do know that short, you can push yourself very hard for short periods of time without overtraining and thus maybe achieve a super compensatory response and that to me is, is the way I program. I look to, to have this in a kind of a wave-like pattern where you periodize and go from uh, a lower type volume. I, when that's ambiguous too. So lower does not necessarily mean one set or three sets. But you, you base this on the individual. So you, you get uh, one lower, then you go a little higher, and then you finish up with a very high or what would be considered very high for that individual and then come back down. So it's in this wave-like pattern where you try to push – you uh, undulate it up so that you push them towards kind of a cliff without going over the cliff and then pull back from that cliff. And it's a successive periods of, of doing that, uh, in my opinion, based not only on research, but the research is very limited on it, but certainly in terms of practical experience. And that's what we have to refer to when uh, there's really no consistent literature. It certainly has a strong rationale, logical basis behind it. And um, again, the important thing to remember is, is that when I throw a leg or when the a study throws out a, uh, a figure like 10 sets per week uh, is better, that's an average. We have to remember that those are mean numbers and that some respond better to somewhat lower and some are going to respond better to somewhat higher. And that's where being intuitive comes in and you have to then experiment. And uh, that's N equals one is, is an important uh, important gauge to use, but only after you use research as, as a basis, as a guideline. So this was Dr. Brad Schoenfeld about volume. A key point Brad mentions is the fact that recent studies only show the average and it doesn't necessarily include that it's the only way to do it. The probably best thing to do is program it in a in an undulative fashion so periodizing it based on your goals and individual needs and capabilities when it comes to recovery the next scene will be with uh, dr james krieger in which he talks about rep ranges intensity and his own experience around that enjoy guys if we were going to give out some kind of general recommendations, what sort of intensities would you tend to program for hypertrophy? Would there be, I know a wide range is very beneficial. Would you say there's benefit to focusing on a certain kind of rep range for any particular reason? I don't think there's any, I mean, I think the data is pretty clear. There's no specific hypertrophy rep range. So I think there's a lot of personal preference. 
Now, some people might argue, is there benefit to varying your repetition ranges possibly? Um, there's not much data on that, I would, I would say. Um, you know, if you're doing it in blocks, you know, there's one study that was recently published where they alternated two-week blocks of high rep and then low rep training. Um, but they didn't, the hypertrophy was the same as, as the people that just did consistently low rep or consistently high rep. So, um, so there wasn't much of a benefit there. I do, I do speculate there may be a benefit to varying your repetition ranges within the same training session. So, um, you know, using your moderately heavy weights um, at first to get some tension stimulus and then following that up with met more metabolic work. I think there may definitely may be some benefit there. Um, but if you are interested in hypertrophy, I would, st I would say just from a time efficiency standpoint, I mean, it's probably best to stick with at least the mo more moderate loads, you know, because if you're training really heavy loads, you know, three rep maxes, four rep maxes, things like that, it's a lot harder to get the volume. You got to do a lot more sets to get the volume in. Um, and then there's, you know, the stress on joint tissues and, and things like that. Uh, so, um, I, you know, I know there's speculation that maybe, maybe if you do some strength phases or something like that, it'll improve the weights that, that, that you can do. But, you know, that really, I would say, hasn't been investigated. I do know the data is pretty clear, though, is prolonged periods of low volume training. When I say low volume I'm not talking necessarily in, in terms of sets. I'm more talking about the, the in terms of uh, repetition range. So if you're doing a lot of three rep sets, mm -hmm. things like that, um, the data is pretty clear. I think if you do extended periods like that, your, your hypertrophy tends to plateau. So so you definitely don't want to do too long of periods in, in you know if you're gonna you know if you are training in those really strength ranges, I would say yeah. you don't want to do too long of periods in those in those rep ranges. But other than that. You know, I don't think there's any specific hypertrophy range. So, so would you say is that moderate rep range? Is that like six to twelve reps, just for the listeners? Yeah, yeah, probably. I, I, even like fifteen and, and something like that. Uh, you know, the thing about like the twenty to thirty rep ranges is it, that's hard to do. There's a certain practical aspect of this. I mean, you could get good hypertrophy from doing you know twenty to thirty reps to failure on everything, but you know. I certainly don't want to be doing 20 to 30 reps to failure on squats or, or, or something like that, you know. Um, you know, and Brad talked about his high rep study versus low rep study. You know, some of the subjects at first were throwing up, you know, w w that were doing the 20 to 30 rep sets. So, so there's a certain practical element, too, of staying in that moderate repetition range. You know, just doing nothing but high rep sets just can be just wipe you out. So, um, so again, I, there's, there's even, you know, ignoring any potential – physiological benefit or hypertrophy benefit that may or may not exist. Again, it's kind of speculation at this point. You know, ignoring that, there is obviously a practical benefit to varying your repetition ranges, mm -hmm. you know, in that sense. So, and I guess Really interesting what James has to say about rep ranges. Um, most important things to know, though, are the facts that working in the 6 to 20 rep ranges for most of your training will most likely yield the greatest hypertrophic results and if hypertrophy is your main goal blocks with lower repetition should only be implemented for short periods of time every now and then so next up it will be mike israel talking about constant tension there i i am aware of absolutely zero fucking reasons that constant tension is a thing i mean zero one thing constant tension might be good for is making sure to get the most metabolite load out of the least total volume. I'll be very clear about what I mean. Leg press. If you constantly have tension on the quads, which means you don't ever lock out, which sucks total balls, you might get 20 reps. That means your volume load was 350 pounds times 20 reps times the distance your legs moved, which is about the same every mm -hmm. time. That's your volume load, and you got to a nasty, nasty, nasty metabolite situation at the end of that. I mean fried, right, where you, like, have to rack the weight and turn over and your, everything's cramped up. <laughs> now, to get the same kind of peak of metabolite expression, you could have done 30 reps by doing Meyer reps. Uh, or rest pause basically right you get 15 mm -hmm. then you rest for just you lock out 
for like five seconds, <sighs> five breaths. And then you go another five and then you lock out for another five seconds and you do another four and a three and a two and a one or whatever. And you get to 30, right? You got this, the same peak metabolite concentration towards the end. So like the last rep of 30, rep number 30, your legs hurt just as much as they did on 20 for the other one. But you did one and a half times the work. So if you're interested for some reason in getting good metabolite expression, but you're interested in minimizing workload, perhaps constant tension is a good idea. Um, there's a complication to that thought. <laughs> We're not so sure. We're reasonably sure, but not 100%. Is it the peak concentration of metabolites reached that is an anabolic stimulus? Or is it the sum area under the curve? Because if it's the area under the curve of total amount of metabolites you've been exposed to, then the myo reps method actually exposes you to more metabolites because you push it almost till you get fucked up and then you stop and you rest and you push it a little bit further and you stop and rest. It's a lot of metabolites. It's a lot of metabolites. It never gets super high you're just toward the end, but you build, 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 and then towards the end it fucks you up. Mm -hmm. So I would say that that style of training, the myo rep style per set is more hypertrophic for sure because it gives you more volume load and it gives you a total bigger under area under the curve metabolite load. But if you want to hit it hard without having to do lots of work and still get a pretty decent metabolite load and decent work, constant tension is the way to go. But thought another way on the flip side, Constant tension artificially delimits how many reps you can do per set. And if, if I was really pushing the metabolite front, my guess as uh, both a scientific thinker and a practical trainer uh, would be that my reps are the way to go because those little rest breaks don't let all the lactate go. They don't let all the metabolites mm -hmm. go. Then you're back to going into hell and you're back and you're back. And they, that's a really, really big stimulus. And it's a lot of volume. Now the volume we can obviate, because we could just say, why don't we just do more straight sets with constant tension? So we, you know, a hundred reps in a workout is a hundred reps, no matter how you fucking get there. Mm -hmm. But a hundred reps with myo rep style might also supply more metabolites because you're in the shit for longer. Mm -hmm. You're not as well rested during the time. Uh, so uh, from that perspective, constant tension is actually worse, right? It was like you do a lap pull down. And after set, rep number 15, you just go to failure and it was constant tension the whole time. It hurt a little bit towards the end, but someone's like, why don't you do rest and do more reps? Like in between, you're like, no bro, constant tension. Like I can't rest because it takes tension off the muscle. And it's like, but if you took tension off the muscle for a second, you went back at it. Wouldn't that fuck you up more? And the answer is, yeah, it would fuck you up more. Disrupt, disrupt homeostasis more. And it gets you probably to grow more per unit volume because there's an additive metabolite load. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what do I think about constant tension? Uh, for the most part, I think that taking many breaks between insofar as it's conducive is actually probably an advantage. Now, there's a very small difference between the two, and the total volume is what really determines most adaptations. But every now and again, something like Meyer reps is a good trick to throw in to really fry shit up that constant tension is unable to do. Uh, mm -hmm. Because constant tension by definition demands that you expose the muscle until it goes uh, assuming to failure, whatever failure proximity you're working with. When you're not able to do any more reps, you have to take a full break and rest and do another set. So that being said, people keep talking about constant tension, constant tension. Well, it's all about tension on the muscle. I'm not exactly sure what the magical appeal of constant tension is. We know that tension, you know, is a matter of generating workload and the sum total tension multiplied by reps is what gets you to grow. So if you get there by, you know, every time you lock out your arms, your triceps stop working. Yeah, but how many total reps did you do? 20. That means you got 20 total tricep stimulus reps. Okay, great. What about with constant tension? Well, they did a set of 15 and I did a set of five. But it was all under constant tension. Well, then your triceps still got a fucking total load of 20 units. Mm -hmm. It's the same shit. So... I'm not a big fan of constant tension uh, for that reason because they, I think it's, it's rather pointless. And I think you can really get more out of a set if you don't have to do constant tension. Right. Mike brought up some really interesting thoughts on why constant tension shouldn't be a concern for you and that focusing on other aspects in your workout or your training is probably a bad idea. 
Coming from volume, frequency, and a training modality, let's move on to a topic which is most often people get wrong and don't see enough value in. I'm, of course, talking about deloads and its importance when it comes to training and nutrition. But let's hear what Dr. Brad Schoenfeld has to say about deloads. I hear people sometimes say deloads aren't required or there's never a time to pull back. And obviously we've talked about overtraining kind of not that that it is a myth necessarily that you don't need deloads but do you want to kind of go over the basis behind deloads and kind of the super compensation effect and potentially like functional overreaching those sort of things yeah deloads are basically uh, short periods of reduced training intensity and or volume or both um where that are designed to uh, rejuvenate and restore a uh, person's recovery, uh, so to really to enhance recovery. Are they required? Um, if you're training really hard, um, my belief is they are. If you're constantly training below threshold, you never need a deload period. But if you're pushing yourself, like I talked about, uh, where you're in different ways, whether it's through higher intensity levels, reduced rest intervals, greater volumes, greater frequencies, whatever it is, if you're pushing yourself really hard, uh, it it behooves you to ensure that you uh, are properly recovered. And again, once you become overtrained, then you've basically gone over the cliff and it's hard. You then have to do a lot of uh, resting to undo the damage that's been done. And that's kind of productive. So at the very least, I would say it is, um, it's prudent to do that because there's really no downside. You don't need to train balls to the wall every week, uh, 365 days or, or let's say 52 weeks out of the year. You, uh, you Having deload periods are not going to impair your results and they very well can enhance them. So that's a good risk reward in my opinion. Everything in well, most things in life are risk reward What's the, or cost benefit. What is the cost? What's the benefit? You're not going to really have any risk of doing it. It's not going to set back your progress and very well could enhance it. It's kind of a no-brainer. How often to do the deloads? That's a uh, subjective question again it will depend upon the person usually somewhere every four to six weeks is kind of a gauge I, I usually use and that tends to fit well for most people mm -hmm. so as Brad mentioned deloads are an important aspect in regards of our recovery and ensuring being able to make constant progress with super compensating from time to time and that a deload every four to six weeks is probably best in terms of training for hypertrophy. Again, let's move on to James Krieger. We touched on volume and rep ranges already, but how about training frequency? What does the current literature say in terms of what might seem optimal? Let's see, uh, well, what I found was I didn't really notice any better gains than when I had trained typically with a, maybe a two or three day per week frequency. And the other thing I noticed is, you know, I'm 40, you know, I just turned 43. So being in my early 40s, I was just, I was getting little joint issues and everything, even though I was really making an effort to try to periodize my training and vary my repetition ranges and not, you know, I was trying to be really careful. It's still, I was just getting all kinds of little issues that were cropping up. So it was, it was obvious to me the really high frequency wasn't working for me. Um, and when you actually delve further into the literature now, you know, the idea between really high frequency training kind of comes from this idea of muscle protein synthesis. So, uh, you know, when you train in the gym, you stimulate muscle protein synthesis, which is the process by which your, your muscles are building new tissue. Um, and that starts basically immediately after your workout. I mean, it's, you know, some people talk about, oh, your, your muscles need so many days to recover before they grow. And that, no, that's not true. Your muscles are growing right away, mm -hmm. like right after your training session. Um, and so the thought behind high frequency training was, you know, in trained individuals, it, it's been observed that the, um, the length of the protein synthesis response doesn't last as long as, as people who are less trained. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that, oh, well, if you're well trained, you need to train more frequently, you need to, you need to get those spikes in protein synthesis more often. And I kind of bought into that at the time, but then when you, but now when you actually look at the research now, um, that idea was based off of what we would call mixed muscle protein synthesis. So your, your muscles have different types of protein and mixed muscle protein synthesis includes all the protein that's in your muscle, 
including like mitochondria, mitochondrial proteins and things like that, um, proteins that don't necessarily contribute to muscle size. And what we really care about is what we would consider myofibril mm-hmm. protein synthesis, the actual, my, the actual things that actually make up the contractile tissue. And when you look at the time course for myofibril protein synthesis, it's actually about the same between trained and untrained subjects. What we're actually calling the question the idea of doing really high frequencies, yeah. um, uh, you know, even if you're a well-trained person. Um, and, uh, you know, the difference between trained and untrained is just that the magnitude of the spike is not as high. Um, there's a dampening of the response as you become more trained. But, again, for myofibril synthesis, it seems that the time course is about the same. So, so this idea of training body parts five, six days per week, you know, might be questionable at least over a long period of time. There may be, there may be some value in doing it over an extremely short period, two, three weeks, something like that. Uh, like a short-term overreaching type thing. Uh, but, you know, over an extended period of time, you know, I don't, I don't, the, the data is not really supportive. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of good research. You know, some people have talked about the Norwegian powerlifting study, you know, and that study, which still hasn't been published to my knowledge, but, uh, you know, that was an elite powerlifter. So I don't really, not sure it's applicable to most people. Um so now I'm pretty much, you know, I've kind of gone back to the typical two to three days per week frequency, you know, which seems to agree with my joints a lot better. And actually, I, I almost think I make better gains off of that. So, cool. Again, awesome stuff by James in which he mentions the recent studies about training frequency in regards to hypertrophy and the so often quoted Norwegian frequency project when there's a discussion around the optimal training frequency and that the that a training frequency of two to three times of training per body part a week is a good starting point for most of the people out there in addition to that i want to share a scene or an excerpt with you guys from dr brad schoenfeld in which he talks about training frequency as well because i think that there's pretty much value in it as well so enjoy this one um what i would say is is that uh the we carried out a study and trained men and it pretty clearly showed that doing a total body routine uh had greater effects on muscle growth than doing the same equated volume on a split routine basis now what i would say to that uh, in opposition, I, I always look to critique my own studies. So we, we have to, each study begets another study. One of the benefits of a split routine is that you can get more volume in per muscle group. We intentionally wanted to equate that so that wasn't a confounding factor. Mm-hmm. If we had, a, had the volumes being different, which would have been more what's called ecologically valid, meaning that it's more consistent with how people train, we would have then lost the control factor and people would have said, well, now how do we know it's the, fre- the volume and not the frequency? So when you do one study and that begets another study, and I'm actually now collaborating on another study that will look at that. Uh, so again, you have to do one before you do the next. But what I'll say is, is that um, it did show greater effects of training more frequently. So that when we split it up, and that would refute the um, contention that you should be doing these bro splits where you do a back day and then a chest day and a shoulder day. Um, but again, that's without looking at the volume factor. Uh, we, our meta analysis uh, pretty clearly showed that two sets or more were better than uh, no, I'm sorry, two two days a week or more were better than just one day a week per muscle. Uh, we were not able to get any, uh, there wasn't enough data to show whether three or four or five might have been even better than that. Um, but again, these were over short term, short time periods, which you have to remember. Also, could there be benefits towards periodizing these? That's one of the things that we often don't look at in research. Uh, or often when we say don't look at when, that when we're evaluating a research study that it's not taken into account. And it's very important to remember that over short time periods, the body can recuperate a lot better. Even when you're pushing yourself towards overtraining, you don't necessarily see the overtrain response taking effect in eight weeks uh, at the levels that we're doing it. So if you keep doing that over the course of six months, eight months, a year, could there be different effects, negative effects? Those are things that we can't tell from the research, and that's why your n equals one has to come in. But what I would say clearly from the research is that 
periods of higher frequency training seem to be effective. And that also kind of fits in with a model of the acute response uh, to protein synthesis, uh, whereby the body, after a training session, the body is max, uh, protein synthesis optimized for about 48 hours or so. So having more multiple, uh, multiple sessions per week of the hitting that muscle might create a greater stimulus. So we're coming close to the end, but before we do, I'd like to hear what Eric Hans has to say about protein intake and the already mentioned muscle protein synthesis. Enjoy guys. That whether you're in a surplus or a deficit, um, the, the, you know, the, the kinetics are the same. Like, you know, you're, you get, a strong muscle protein synthesis dose from from taking protein in and from a resistance training and it can augment the protein response. Uh, there's still a refractory period and you know between meals you are um, actually catabolizing you know proteins and, and uh, you're going into a net negative protein balance and the, the the height of those peaks and the depth of those valleys just change uh, deficit compared to surplus. So it's you know I I'd, I'd like to get a little away from strictly saying retention during dieting and gaining during a um, you know a surplus because it it gets people back into that mindset that oh I cannot gain muscle yeah. while I'm dieting uh, when in reality you're probably gaining small amounts while you have higher body fat levels and your deficit isn't large and then it's you know much harder to do so and you might be losing a little bit by the end and the net change is a small loss of muscle over like I say a six month prep uh, for most people um, so the yeah I I, I don't. I don't think it changes either way. I think um, whatever would result in the best growth response would probably res also result in the best muscle retention. Yeah. Um, you know, there are, are some things your body does when you go into a deficit. It makes your utilization of protein more efficient. You know, which is a great indicator of saying, "Hey, I, I'm at a risk of losing muscle mass. So I'm going to need to do more with what I have." Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so uh, so yeah, I don't I don't think it necessarily um, would, would change either way in my opinion. And have you ever, on a related note, with your clients, have you ever had someone go kind of really want to push their protein high and seen benefit from that or even the other way, kind of bring it really low and actually retain muscle perfectly fine and like you can give them more carbs and they can train better or something like that? Yeah, I, I have. And, um, you know, for the most part within the ranges that we are comfortable with as bodybuilders, which is typically... You know, like, like that 1.8 grams per kg up to, uh, you know, three, slightly over three grams per kg. Um, I don't see a whole heck of a lot of differences. Mm -hmm. um, and with the people who let me experiment and, uh, and, and, and play around, some people feel better though. And I think... Again, a really interesting and valuable lesson from the man Eric Helms from Team 3DMJ. Most importantly though, is that there shouldn't be a severe difference when it comes to protein intake when cutting or gaining and that 1.8 grams to 3 grams per kilogram of body weight is a good starting place for most of the athletes out there. Speaking of gaining, Let's take the last excerpt from an interview with Mike Isratel in which he talks about what might be a good rate of body weight gain for hypertrophy. So there is no direct data on how fast you should gain. I mean, nothing reliable. And, and any of it that it does exist is on pure beginners. So there's a ton of problems with that. Um, my, my views on gaining are the following. I think that Anything faster than uh, a percent of your body weight per week um, is, is downright stupid and even with the best pharma is ridiculous and you're just going to get super, super fat up to about half a percent of your body weight per week. So which for me is, you know, just over a pound per week uh, under half a kilo, I think is quite reasonable. Anything, you know, up to about half a percent uh, per week. Um, or sorry, a, a, a quarter of a percent per week uh, of body weight um, is reasonable still and just erring on the side of a little slower. Anything a below a quarter of a percent, let's just get into some tracking problems where people will say that you can use weekly weight averages. You can, but you could be making a mistake for three weeks and the averages don't tell you shit. Uh, and you just pissed away three weeks of massing. You weren't actually massing. You were maintaining. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what you think you were doing. Um, and the other one is I'm not so clear that the overload principle in some sense doesn't apply to nutrition as well as to training. Here's what I mean by that. 
I think that uh, you have to push your body out of comfort zones nutritionally. There will get to be a point where you gaining very slowly or attempting to gain very slowly is going to result in just metabolic upregulation and not a whole lot of anything else. Uh, really, we've seen really high elevations of NEAT. You know, people just start moving around more, sweating more, fidgeting more, and it's just nothing happens. I think sometimes you have to smash it in a little bit to get bigger. Um, one thing I do know almost for certain is that almost, almost, not all, almost everyone who's really, really big has had periods where they've gone a little bit faster and more aggressively than like, you know, a tenth of a pound or whatever, or ten, uh, 1% of body weight, you know, per month. I think that's still a fine figure. Anything much lower than that, it starts to be difficult to track, and I'm not so convinced that it's the best way to go. There, there are a couple of other things. Gaining muscle is hard. Your body eventually becomes very homeostatically resistant to new muscle additions. Mm -hmm. Losing fat is relatively easy as long as you don't go overboard and become obese. So if you gain, you know, um, three kilos of total tissue, and half a kilo of that or something like that is, let's say you gain four kilos of total tissue and one kilo of that is uh, going to be muscle. You're going to lose the three kilos of fat and then no problem. If you gain eight total kilos and two of those, or maybe one and a half of those are muscle and the rest is fat, that might actually be better because that's muscle you may not have gained at all mm -hmm. had you stuck to the much more incremental gains. It is a nuisance, nuisance thing that many of the individuals that espouse this really slow gaining seem to themselves be, and with their cohorts, just not very, not very big individuals. Um, and, and, and this applies to people across the community of pharmacology and not. There are bodybuilders in the pharmacological community, right? And drug test, drug using bodybuilders who are notorious for saying, keep it really slow. And they're also guys that continue to argue every year that mass is being too prioritized, that slimmer, more appealing physiques are better. And they still weigh 190 or 200 pounds instead of like 260 or 280. You know, man, if gaining that slow was really cool and really worked to optimize size, maybe you'd see bigger people advocating it. Um, it it's like, it's almost like seeing, um, seeing individuals that you know advocate staying away from heavy training as a good way to get really big well there's just not a lot of people that did that, that are big that didn't train super heavy and there's all, an empirical observation to be made there mm -hmm. uh, and it's not really an ad hominem attack it's just this very inconvenient reality so uh, i think that um, you know, taking all those things in, in together, especially that kind of disruption of homeostasis that you want with kind of force feeding, I think sometimes the periods of that are necessary. Um, so, uh, you know, kind of all that taken together, I think if you're getting good results from slower gains, I think that's totally cool. If you are getting into the situation where you're trying to gain slower and it's really kind of not working and your body weight stopped moving, um, it might be time to try to gain a little bit faster, especially if you don't like to spend time in this kind of an equi you know, uh, equivocal area of am I gaining weight or not. Um, mm -hmm. And I also think because body fat is relatively easy to lose, trying to stay as lean as possible while gaining is a fool's errand. And people do that all the time. You know, people will say, you know, some of the, the guys in the industry that will say, you know, don't gain any faster than, you know, a percent per month. Some people go, wow, I'll just gain half a percent per month because I'll just gain pure muscle. You end up gaining not a whole lot of anything. You're just, just intentionally yeah. short circuiting yourself. And, and then what? Mm -hmm. It's a problem. I do. See so this was it, guys. Our special episode about training for hypertrophy in which we covered training volume, rep ranges, training frequency, deloads, protein intake, and what might be a good rate of weight gain when hypertrophy is your main goal. I'm sure this episode was extremely valuable for you and that you're now able to get out there and implement the things all the knowledgeable guys talked about so that you can get as jacked and shredded as never before. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. I hope you liked the episode. We would highly appreciate if you would leave us a review over at iTunes or subscribe to our YouTube channel because every support helps us massively in spreading the knowledge. So again, thanks for your support and talk to you soon, guys. Cheers.